Welcome to How to Write Good. I am your host, Daniel Poppy. You can find out more about me at danielpoppy.com. Uh, Poppy is spelled P-O-P-P-I-E. So check that out, danielpoppy.com, danielpoppy.com. Again, check that out. Uh, I've got a book, an entire book written that you can check out called The Ninth Hour. It is in the sci-fi fantasy uh, genre. It is more in the fantasy genre, but if you like that genre, I would definitely go have you go over, check it out, read more about it, see if you're interested in it. Uh, also, I have a serialized novel that is more in the crime thriller revenge, revenge genre. And if you like stuff like Count of Monte Cristo, you go over there, you check that out, you see what you like. Uh, you don't even have to read that one. That one's put out as a podcast form. It's put out in written form. If you're too lazy or if you're not a reader, because I actually made that specifically in response to a friend of mine who isn't, and I'm like, you know, I'm just going to record all these for you. And uh, yeah, that's for him. Hope he enjoys it. Yeah, it's a little bit more work. It's not unbelievably more work, but it's a little bit more. Uh, the word of the week is anachronism. Anachronism means something out of place uh, in its time. So typically it refers to something old-fashioned in its time. Um, it, I guess it could mean something that is is ahead of its time. So if you see something that's really futuristic and uh, maybe you saw stuff like this. So if you know of the video game Fallout, there's a lot of anachronisms in Fallout because they are taking this really high-level uh, nuclear age technology and they're pairing it with 1950s the 1950s um, what is the aesthetic from the 1950s but one person who doesn't care about the accuracy or didn't care about the accuracy and I'm a big fan of this he didn't care about the accuracy of exact uh, the little details in his in his plays was Shakespeare so Shakespeare has a lot of things in his plays that weren't correct for the time period but he, again, he wasn't focused on whether things were correct or not for the time period. He was, he was focused on creating a really uh, compelling story. And again, I, I, I have a podcast episode on Shakespeare. My opinion is that Shakespeare was very good. My opinion is also that you can learn a lot from Shakespeare. At the same time, I think that there is a... He was really, really good. The issue is that people, um, people sh <laughs> treat Shakespeare like a messiah. And I don't think that he deserves that. I think that he... The issue with pulling things from the past is, one, we speak differently than Shakespeare. Therefore, it's going to probably be the case that Shakespeare sounds... If we come to Shakespeare assuming that Shakespeare is unbelievably good, we're going to make assumptions about how he writes and say, oh, that's unbelievably good, right? Um, what I've seen in Shakespeare is that, yes, he has a lot of really good stuff. He puts together, there's certain word combinations he puts together that's very good, but at the same time, it's not necessarily the case that uh, he, he he took the time to do it, okay? Um, in the past, I've talked about this idea that people place specific people on pedestals and then they use those people on pedestals as excuses for their own ability to not do things or not being able to do things. So if someone is really good at something and you're like, well, that person just has an innate talent, they're just unbelievably good, then it gives you an excuse to say, well, I'm not unbelievably good, just naturally. And you don't see all the work that goes behind it. So in my opinion, Shakespeare probably put a lot of work into what he was doing um, and he was probably a lot more normal than you think he was. He had a lot of dirty jokes in his stuff. So I'm guessing he was more normal than you actually think he was. Uh, so in a lot of cases, I think that people think that person is more capable than them when in reality, it might be the case that that person just is putting in a lot more work. Um, I think that it's that's the case in a lot more situations. But yeah, so Shakespeare used anachronisms in a lot of different ways. Uh, so in Antony and Cleopatra, he mentions billiards. Everybody knows that billiards didn't exist in Egypt at that time. Um, that's right after Alexander the Great, I believe, right? If I get my time period correct, I might be wrong about that. He also mentions the dollar in the specific um, play when the dollar didn't exist. He mentions a clock in Julius Caesar. Clocks didn't, didn't exist in ancient Rome. We all know that, or at least I hope we all know that. Though that. So anachronisms are things that are out of their time. And again, it usually refers to things that are old-fashioned, but as you can see with Shakespeare, the clock was not old-fashioned in, uh, in relation to ancient Rome. The clock was actually a new thing. So that is, um, you see that word a lot more. This is actually a word that is, the word anachronistic or anachronism 
is not an anachronism itself. This is actually a word we use. It's not something that's out of out of style. You can have anachronism anachronisms in how you speak as well. Um, I think saying shall has become an anachronism. People don't use it in speech. Uh, people, it's usually used as a joke or something like that. I don't know why you'd use it as a joke, but it's it's an anachronism in how people talk. So we are going to get into the accidental essence. Use anachronism as much as you want. We are going to get into the accidental lessons, and I was wrong. Um, the good thing about this podcast and how I present it is that I, it is a, if you listen to this podcast, never hear contradictions. Uh, so I say something and it's 50 episodes ago, and then suddenly you, you, uh, you go through this podcast and I'm suddenly saying something else. Well, first of all, I might not be contradicting myself. It might be the case that there's more nuance to the, the thing I'm talking about. In some cases, it's just because I've, I've grown and I try to be co cognizant of the fact that I'm not correct about everything. And I try to be cognizant of, of information that I've changed my mind on. And this is, I don't know if I've, I'm still thinking about this idea. And I don't know if I've changed my mind completely on it, but I, I'm pretty sure that my mind's been changed on it. Uh, in the past, on this podcast, I've talked about this idea that, so... There's this quote from Stephen King, or there's this idea where Stephen King says uh, that writing is self-hypnotism. And I'm just like, you know, Stephen, Mr. King, uh, Mr. King, I don't think that's the case. And I think the reason why I thought that he was incorrect was because I didn't understand what I was talking about, which happens a lot. So I've, I found this in life. Here's a piece of life advice. If you get into a con... Uh, con if you get into a argument with somebody, try to get down to the basics of what they mean. Because in a lot of cases between people of goodwill, uh, some people you run into and you just have to be like, you know, we're never gonna agree because this person doesn't even, they don't even, they will not even engage. Uh, there's a few reasons why you should just walk away from an argument. If a person will not engage in a good faith argument and they, they automatically have their assumptions and they won't actually Think about the ideas, right? So some people will disagree with you and they'll actually be like, yeah, I'll think about those ideas and I'll, I'll actually try to give you a fair hearing, but they're going to end up, um, they're probably not gonna end up changing their minds. That's different, but some people walk into an argument and they, uh, they, do, they have their assumptions and their assumptions are never gonna change. And it's not going to argue, their assumptions are not based on reason. Uh, most people's I think aren't, but I think most people have this this emotional sense in themselves that they'll allow somebody to say what they will and they'll be uh, open-minded to what that person is saying. But these people who will, will not argue, these people who will not talk at all, their, um, their arguments are not based on reason, their arguments are based on emotion. Therefore, you have to approach it from an emotional perspective. So you do not argue with someone who does it in bad faith, do not argue with someone who refuse it they think you're an idiot, they refuse to even uh, consider your point of view, If you even if you have good ideas. Um, those people you don't approach with arguments. Those people you uh, you do you approach it more subtly until you get them to a point where they actually will argue or they um, see it from a different perspective, just out of their own, because of themselves, because they've gone through a specific experience. Um, so with this with this podcast, um, like I was saying before, even though I got into the weeds of the argument thing, with this podcast. I always try to grow and process through what's going on. Oh yeah, with the argument again. Uh, if you go into an argument with a person, figure out what the person means by what they're saying because you can actually solve a lot of conflicts because you both mean the same thing, but you're talking about it in different ways, right? You both mean the same thing, you're talking about it in different ways. So when you go into an argument, when you go into a fight with somebody that you actually like, that you actually have a relationship with, get down to the be like hey what do you mean by this and get down to the very basic bedrock of what they think as opposed to going back and forth uh because you are you're really just va vacillating back um you're really just m making stuff up that you're trying to support your argument but you're not really supporting your argument you're just saying you're wrong here's why uh then they're saying you're wrong here's why and in some cases you might just be using different words now there are definitely real arguments but get back down to the meaning of those basic ideas that you're talking about because it might be the case that you find out hey we both actually agree on this and because we both actually agree on this basic idea then we can move on from there
If you can't agree on basic ideas, you're going to have a really hard time agreeing on anything else. And if you can't get past those basic definitions, uh, you're not going to get anywhere in an argument. You have to get those basic definitions, those basic ideas, and what they mean down. But with um, with this situation of Stephen King saying that writing is self self hypnotism, I uh, I came into this, I came into seeing that, and I saw well, hypnotism is where you uh, get people to do stuff. Um, you know, I had a very it was a very straw man picture of hypnotism. And if you know anything about logic and logical fallacies, a straw man argument is where you present the argument in the in the poorest light and then you knock it down. It's a logical fallacy because the a lot of arguments are much more robust. I see you see the logical uh, fallacy of, of the straw the straw man fallacy really often. People will be like, Well, I think this and this and this. This is this is this argument they have over here. And because um, this is a stupid argument, you know, we can even dismiss it. You know, this is why they're wrong. When in reality, that person who is defending that argument might have extremely good ideas that are very hard to go against. Um, you see it. You see it with perspectives. Uh, you see it with people quite often because uh, it's it's easy. It's lazy. It's it's mental laziness, honestly, the straw man argument. Because if you were to actually consider what the argument of the other side was, it would actually take you time. Everybody has only a limited amount of time. I think it's natural in a person's mind to say, hey, I have a limited amount of time. It's, it's more of a natural reaction. I have a little bit, limited amount of time. Here's what this is. This is stupid. This is why it's stupid. Boom. Instead of going into the research. So it's actually, it's actually a rational thing to do the straw man argument because you don't have that much time. Uh, but at the same time, the straw man argument is not logical. I hope that makes sense. So yeah, so I had I had the straw man picture of hypnotism, and when I walked into this, I'm like, well, I know about, I know about um, flow because I've talked about that before, where you get into the sense of flow, and this is a state between anxiety and um, comfort, where you're not too comfortable, you're you're you are your brain is activated, uh, and you're comfortable at the same time, so you're able to get rid of all the distractions, you're you're capable of what you're doing. And this has been talked about people before. If uh, this has been talked about other people uh, about from other people before, if I can actually speak, uh, where if you're capable of something, you're going to be able to get into flow faster. And the reason why you're going to be able to get into flow faster if you're more capable of something is because once you learn something well, your brain, uh, you you're creating pathways in your brain that shortcut to that task. Okay, does that make sense? The when you're a kid, and this is a little off in the weeds, when you're when you're a baby, your brain makes all these tons of different connections. And then as you get older, as you become an adult, it, it, it's called what's pruning these connections. So your brain's like, oh, let's make all these connections because we're prepping you for life. And whatever you use the most, we're going to actually make shortcuts in your brain. It's going to activate faster. It's going to do it more naturally. And then we're going to be able to do it faster. So you don't have to think about it as much. Because again, we only have a limited amount of we only have a limited amount of uh, energy, right? Every time you're making a decision, every time you're forced to do something consciously, you're getting rid of some of your energy. You're taking, you're getting worn down. It takes more time to do that. The more time it takes to do something, the more energy it's taking. We only have a limited amount of energy. We, we only have a limited amount of time. The brain is, uh, the, the brain, how it works in the body is to, to make those shortcuts so we don't have to so we don't have to actually take as much time to do that thing. So if you've been writing for 40 years and you do it, have done it consistently, if you've developed that habit, it's going to be much easier for you to shortcut into writing, right? It doesn't take 40 years, don't worry. It's gonna take much less time to shortcut into writing than it is if somebody was only writing for a year. They're, that person, younger writers have a harder time uh, getting into writing. I don't have a hard time sitting down and writing something good because I've been writing so long that it's just a part of my natural way of doing things, right? Uh, if you've been if you've been doing anything for a long period of time, your mind starts to look at the world through that lens. If that makes sense, right? I have the writing lens. I have the and I've I've talked about this in the past, but I've talked about it in different ways. I have this specific right. I don't know what I was doing right here. Uh, I have this specific writing lens, right? And if I look at the world through this writing lens, I have more ideas come to me. 
right? I have this idea lens where I keep my eyes on little bits and pieces of the world and I pull them in and I'm like, hey, this could be good for writing. That, that could be good for writing. Uh, the writing lens can deal with set pieces. The writing lens can deal with characters. The writing lens can deal with plot points. The writing lens can deal with premises of books and different things like that. But if I have that, that those glasses on, uh, that those write, that light, writing lens on, I, I see the world in a way where I have tons more ideas for writing. Um, and it and it works for anything. I have a friend who's really into economics. If you're if you're listening to this podcast, hey, I hope you're doing well. I have a friend who's very into economics and finances. He looks at so many things through an economic and finance lens. It is very useful, right? Um, just because it just because it's analogous to the real world, it's it still can be very useful to look at the real world. Sorry, my hair is being ridiculous right now. Um, but whatever lens you're looking for is through is the one that, that you're going to shortcut to, especially if you have practice looking through that lens. My um, what I've been doing the longest is writing. What I've been doing the longest is writing. Therefore, when I look at something, when I when I get into that mindset, when I get into writing, it's much easier for me to do that because my mind has shortcut it. OK, and that's what we get with flow. Flow is your mind. Uh Flow is hard. It's hard to be creative. It's hard to get into that flow state uh, where you are completely engaged and, and time just starts to fly. It's hard to get into that when you're anxious. It's hard to get into that when you are tired or you're not engaged, right? If you're bored, you're not going to get into that. If you're uh, anxious, you're not going to get into that as easily. But at that same time, that flow state is your mind. I think it's your mind shortcutting into that task you're doing. So if you are someone who does woodworking and you get into woodworking and you suddenly start working on that thing, um, what you're doing is you are slipping into that state where things start to move really well. Like it's time starts to move fast. Um, it's, it's a Zen state. So if you've ever read, if you're someone who's ever read Zen in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, which is a super famous book and I recommend it. It's fairly big, but I recommend it. I think it's interesting. It teaches you about focus, honestly. Um, and it, and it makes you think about focus and how you should approach tasks. But what he talks about in that book is this idea where instead of, instead of just trying to um, force things to happen, you take your time on them. And if you take your time on something, then you'll eventually get into the state where you start to think of it on a more conceptual level. And it won't be frustrating. It'll be satisfying. And that's that same idea of a flow state. The weird thing about a flow state, it, it, it seems to be semi-conscious. Conscious. Sorry about that. Even I can't talk sometimes. A flow state is, is not... It's not the higher, it doesn't seem to be the highest level of consciousness, if that makes sense to you. In some cases, it feels like it is, right? When I, um, For me, when I'm writing and I'm in that state of that mindset, it's like, man, everything's coming to me. Everything's coming. I'm putting things together in a way that I just never knew I could. It's, it's almost, it almost feels like a superpower, but again, it isn't. It takes a lot of practice. I think that you can get to that state if you don't get to that state, if you do practice a lot. So don't worry. I think it's just something you have to practice on. We've lost the sense of practice. And I know I'm going out for the weeds again. We've lost this idea that practice is really what makes somebody an expert in something. Very few people are experts in anything without practice. Um, very, I don't think there's, I, there's probably not anyone who's an expert in anything without practice. So if you practice, you can get to the point, whichever art form you like, uh, it, when you're first starting out, it's tough. But that, yeah, that flow state comes with any time you're shortcutting into that idea. And for me, it's kind of like being in a dream state. And I think that if you think about, um, look at that word salad. I think that if you think about anything that you're good at and when you start to do it and you start to feel like time is going by, it feels more like a dream. Any time where you are, you feel good and you're getting tons of stuff done and it's just like, man, this is awesome. It does feel dreamlike. Um, so I think that it is, it's an altered state of consciousness that is brought on by yourself. Um, so again, let's get back to mesmerization or hypnotism because um, just two different words for the same thing. So hypnotism I had this very straw man picture of, you know, you have people in a crowd, the hypnotist brings the person up. And um, when the hypnotist, the hypnotist makes them do something weird, stuff like that. But hypnotism um, is really persuasion. Hypnotism is really just the power of persuasion. It's not the power of, you're not controlling someone because of, um, 
them just being asleep or half asleep and people who are hypnotized aren't asleep or half asleep people who are hypnotized are just in a very relaxed state or they're very suggestive um, when you are very tired you're more likely to do specific things i know I've, this has happened to me in the past so in the past there's been times where I've been very tired, and when you're very tired, your lips get loose, you say whatever you want, and you start to do funky things. Your inhibitions go down. Uh, maybe some people out there have had um, not too many drinks, but you get to a point where you just start being suggestive, you start to loosen up. This is the same idea. What hypnotists do is they put you in this, they don't, they don't put you in this state, um, but they bring you to this point where you are in this more suggestive state, and then they're like, oh, do this, do that, and the people who are hypnotized, quote unquote, they are doing these things because they are in a suggestive state and um, they are willing to do them, right? Nobody who is hypnotized is going to do something that they are unwilling to do in real life. They, they actually want to do those things. So when you're in that state, if, you, if you, maybe some people are putting together the pieces. When you are writing, when you're in a state of flow, you are in a very, um, not, you're in somewhat of a semi-conscious state where things are more dreamlike right? Uh, things are moving by in a way that is just satisfying. And in a lot of cases, dreams are just satisfying. Things are moving in a way where, um, where you're not fully aware of everything around you. You're just focused on that one uh, foot by foot space in front of your face. When you're, when you're working on something, that's what happens. And when you're hypnotized, you're in a very, uh, you are in a very suggested, suggestive mood. I don't know if I use that correctly. And um, the connection is that they're, they're a similar state of mind. And I would actually like to go, so I'm going to explain why I think that it's hypnotism, but I'm going to actually go even farther. I'm going to say that, that writing is self-hypnotism, but the act of someone, uh, you writing a book is actually hypnotizing somebody else. And it all comes back to suggestion, right? Um, it all comes back to suggestion. It all comes back to persuasion. What is persuasion? A persuasion is doing specific things, talking in a specific way, uh, trying to connect to a person in a specific way so that they do, you do, they do what you want them to do, or, and this goes along with them doing it, they think along the same lines that you want them to think. Now, this could be something that is uh, bad. Right, you could persuade somebody to do something bad, but it also could be something very good. It could you could be a benevolent persuader where you're like, hey, and you're and you're telling the person I'm trying to persuade you, but you could be a benevolent persuader where you are saying, well, this is why this is happening. You're trying to bring them into what you're doing because you know it's a good thing for them to do, or you know it's a good thing for um, for other people. So you could be a benevolent persuader. Um, but with writing, what you're doing to yourself is you're persuading yourself to slip into the story, right? Uh, you, and, and I think that everybody who's been writing for, for a significant amount of time, this happens to them. And even people who are new writers, this is why new writers, this is the reason why new writers have a harder time. There are certain times when new writers feel exper um, not experienced, they feel inspired, right? They feel inspiration, so they sit down and they slip into that state where they just can write like crazy. They write for 17 hours straight. Uh, they snort a line of coke. They keep on going. And then they, they stop for seven years, right? Um, that's an exaggeration, but you know what I mean, where it's on and off and on and off. And it certainly was the case when I was younger because I was developing that writing habit. So even if you're younger and you're having a hard time of writing, realize that you keep on going, keep on doing it, keep on writing as much as you can. You will develop the habit if you keep on doing it. But what they're doing is they're slipping into that more suggestive state they're making themselves experience a story in their own minds they are writing in a specific way where they connect to pleasure centers in their brain in a way they connect to the story uh, th there's a there's a structure in our brain how we work is that we love stories we love stories honestly that's why stories have always been a part of human culture I, like I talked about, I think last week, um, stories are at the core of who we are. We tell ourselves stories. We tell other people stories. How we function is based on a story. From my perspective, you can certainly disagree with that. We tell ourselves stories and we work our lives off of that story. But what we're doing when we're, we're writing, we writers, what we're doing is we are telling ourselves a story, 
but we have to write in a specific way. Sorry, my mouse was in the way. We have to write in a specific way so that we slip into that story. We are going through that process of, um, in, in some cases, people think that you need to have this really grabbing hook, right? You start somebody in a story, you start someone uh, reading a story and the story has to start with action, but that's not necessarily the case. It does have to start start with something that keeps the reader reading, right? So there has to be something in that story where the reader is saying, huh, I wanna keep on going forward with this. You are piquing their interest. You are pushing them forward. You are, say, persuading them with how you write your book, with how you write your story uh, to keep on moving forward and finish that book and finish that story, right? Um, so that's where it connects, right? So when you are someone who is trying to persuade someone else, you are you are taking them step by step until they are actually agreeing with you or doing with you doing what you want them to do. If you are writing a book, you are bringing a person into something. First, you're presenting an idea to a person because not everybody's going to um, not everybody is going to read all of your book, right? Not everybody's going to pick it up. But if somebody picks it up, they're going to see it, they're going to read that first sentence, and then they're going to be like, huh, okay, I'm I'm persuaded enough to keep on moving on. I My interest has been piqued. I think this person has presented a compelling enough story that I want to keep, keep on reading it. It keeps on pulling the person in. So when you write write the first the book the first time, uh, when you get into that state of flow, you've persuaded yourself to want to hear that story right? You want to hear that story. And in some ways you've, and you can persuade yourself to do something. We do it all the time, right? Uh, in some cases, persuading yourself to do something isn't a good thing. So for me, I love ice cream and, and there's always that, you know, you drive by someplace and you're like, huh, it'd be nice to have ice cream. And even though you don't necessarily, and even though you're telling yourself, hey, like, you know, maybe you shouldn't get that ice cream. You keep on, you keep on feeling that pull inside of you. It's like, well, you know, it's going to be really good going to be really tasty it's going to be this and this and that it's it's going to go down smooth it's going to go down easy because it's ice cream and it's the most delicious thing in existence um so you keep on persuading yourself to do that and we we can persuade ourselves to do negative things or we can um writing and doing something creative as a career is, is a very difficult thing so i think that you have to have a lot of persuasion skills to push yourself forward into um to keep on going, to keep on developing, to keep on getting better, because I certainly think it is a state, it is a career, any type of creative field is one in which you need to get better. Um, like I've said before, you can have a basic level of writing to be successful in the career, but you do still need to push on. And I think this isn't anything, you keep on pushing on, you keep, keep on getting better. Anytime we are making bad decisions in our life, anyone who has chosen to say, I give up, has persuaded themselves to give up. It might be the case that they've been told throughout their lives that they can't make it, but at the same time, you have to, um, and I, I know how that feels. I know that it is really difficult when you've been told that you aren't able to do something in your life. I realize it's a really difficult thing. At the same time, you can tell yourself, you know what, maybe those people are lying. Why don't we just try something? And then people persuade themselves to do things like that. People persuade themselves to be successful. They say, well, you know, I'm going to keep on pushing on. I don't know what's going to happen in the future. Let's just keep on trying this. Let's just see if it works and let's see what happens. So you're, you're persuading yourself back and forth every time. When you're writing a book, you're persuading yourself. You're persuading yourself to keep on reading slash writing that book because when you write the book, you also read the book, which is kind of a bizarre little thing. Um, one of the most satisfying things about writing for me is, is writing that first draft because I get to see how it's playing out. And by the time I get done with all my edits and I'm at my final draft, I hate the book. <laughs> so it's just part of it. But I get to read that book and I get to say, huh, yeah, that's how it played out. That's how it should have been. And, um, you know, sometimes there's missteps. Sometimes I can't do it as well, as well as I'm able to. But I can still do it, right? I still read that story. I still enjoy it. And it is very enjoyable. So we've got this persuasion aspect, right? We have this hypnotism requires persuasion. Uh, hypnotism also uh, is paired with this idea of being in the semi-conscious state where things are, where you're very suggestive, where you're very relaxed, right? And uh, writing, like I said before, is being in that semi-conscious state where you are very relaxed, but you're also engaged with what you're doing. So um, the weird, here's, here's how, how I would pair it. The 
the hypnotist is the writing you're doing. The hypnotist is what is pushing you forward uh, in hypnotism. You are the one in the very relaxed state. Uh, in writing itself, writing is the thing that is pushing you forward. Writing is functioning as the hypnotist. And um, the you, you reading that story, you being pulled forward by that writing is the person who is being hypnotized, right? Because so, it's, not, it's not this mystical thing. It's something that happens to each of us in our lives. In some cases, people... If you get drawn up in a story, like in a movie, you are being in a way hypnotized because you're first you're you're going into this relaxed state, but you're also being engaged at this specific level. You're 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 being pulled into the story. You're being pulled forward with the story. You're being um, you're being persuaded to stay engaged with that story. Sometimes you go to a movie and you are completely bored, and you say you say I just don't want to watch this at the same time. The cool thing about writing is that you are both the person writing the book. And telling yourself the story and the person in that very relaxed state they exist in yourself at the same time i just think that's really cool you are also hypnotizing uh if we use it in that specific way of persuading persuasion you are also hypnotizing the person reading the book right and the way this works is um like i said before a person, first of all, the the book itself, the story you're telling is a pleasurable one. So you need to be able to write in a way that is pleasurable, that people enjoy. And and write words are not just words are not just utility. Words are beautiful at the same time. Words are things that people hear and they just like, right? There's certain words we like more than others. People like the sound of their own name. And uh, that tells us that there there's more than just getting information across. There's specific pleasure we feel at specific words and sometimes that pleasure is connected to the sound of the word and that sounds weird but I think it definitely is true sometimes pleasure is connected to the sound of the word sometimes pleasure is connected to the meaning of the word usually both and so what you are doing with a story is you are writing amazing words that's something that is going to put the person in a relaxed state because when you feel pleasure you are more relaxed um, that person is going to be writing, you're going to be, they're going to be hearing those amazing words. At the same time, they're going to be connecting to specific characters. One thing that is also relaxing in real life is the fact that you can connect to someone on a very deep level. Well, what writing does, what reading a book does, is it connects you to characters without any risk, right? So if you have no risk in a situation, you're not going to have a high anxiety level, you're going to be more, uh, you're going to be more comfortable, right? You're going to be more at ease. So it connects you to characters in almost all writing who have, there's no risk for you, but you get to know that character on a very deep level. You get to read their thoughts or you get to you get to know their intimate ideas. Um, so that's one. The, the third thing that puts you into this pleasurable, relaxed state is the story itself. Again, humans are, uh, humans just love stories. If you present a human uh, story to a person, a person will automatically start to feel uh, more pleasure because of that story. If you want to convince someone to do something, put it in a story format, and they're probably more likely to go on, go go along with you than if it wasn't in a story format. So those things are those things are putting people into that trance-like state. They're putting people into that very suggestive state. Um, what's a parallel in life that I would put? So if you uh, if you know someone who is if you know someone who is um, slow to warm up, right? There's someone who you meet and they're shy because they're nervous around new people. This happens with them. This happens with pretty much everybody in some case or another, but this happens especially with people who are slow to warm up. The person will probably be, seem standoffish, right? It doesn't mean they don't like you. It might mean that they're just nervous. What what happens then is that a person is, uh, they, they eventually get, get, get um, what's the word I'm looking for? They get comfortable around somebody. And they're more willing to do things that person wants them to do. I've known people in the past who are shy individuals, and then they meet someone who is very gregarious. And then they get comfortable, they become friends with that person, and then the person who is gregarious kind of pulls that person along into things that that shy person wouldn't otherwise do. It's not that that shy person is being controlled. They want to do those things that gregarious person is doing, but they, um, in some cases, they need a little push. It can actually it can actually get to the point where they play off of each other, where that shy person and the gregarious person are each taking the lead in different situations. So the person who is shy is, um, is pulling the person who's gregarious forward into certain things or persuading them to do certain things through actions or words, and the person who is 
uh, gregarious is also pulling that shy person forward. That's a very specific situation where this phenomenon is happening. It happens in life all the time. In uh, in reading, when a person reads a book, you're putting them into a very relaxed state. Books, uh, if you like reading, if you're someone who reads books, you re probably read fiction for pleasure, right? Uh, you probably read it for pleasure. So you read fiction, you read a book, you read a story, you put it, get put into this really relaxed state. And then the author, because you're, you're allowing the author to do it, right? If you don't like an author, you're going to read a book and you're going to say, ah, they suck, their ideas are horrible, yada, 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 etc. Um, yada, 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 and etc. I know they are both it's redundant to say both, but we've got to add both because that's just how the world works. So you're getting in a relaxed state and, and you're allowing the author to pull you forward into that hypnotism. They're hypnotizing you. Uh, and then what they are doing is they are making you play that movie of the book in your head. That's the hypnotism that is going on. They're pushing you forward. They're convincing you to keep on reading because it, it's just so satisfying. And then they're making you put together the pieces of that book in, in your head. Uh, one more quick thing, and then, then I'm going to be done. So the cool thing about books, what I, what I, the reason why I love the medium of books is because it is something that requires a Every type of art requires a viewer or different things like that. But with books specifically, it requires the person reading to actually be engaged and engaged in this specific way. If a person is able to get into that relaxed state, which it is the responsibility of the writer to be as good as possible so that the reader can easily get into that relaxed state. But if the reader gets into that relaxed state and they're pulled forward to buy that book, um, they are creating... They are doing, they're creating what the writer has created afterwards, right? They are taking the pieces of what the writer has written and they're putting it together in a new way. And I think that's really cool. And maybe that's the reason why, um, why people love books so much, right? You have these people who just love reading. They love stories uh, in book format because it's not just taking something that someone has plastered on a screen. It takes more energy. Um, and I, I think that's really the cool thing about this art form. And that's one of the reasons why I love this art form because, and that's one of the reasons why I'm not in favor of making books into movies because it does something. And I, I've talked about in the past, I'm not going into it right now. But yeah, so I think, I, 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 I guess I agree with Stephen King if that's what he's trying to say is that you're leading yourself into this very suggestive state. So I was wrong. And I definitely, uh, I definitely will admit that. And I hope that this explanation of why I think that's the case makes sense and I, I think that it fits very well with what hypnotism is with what this persuasion is uh, and the the re relaxed state it's an amazing thing it's an amazing thing um and people and it's not like you're controlling somebody right somebody isn't if somebody picks up a book they don't just read because you're forcing them to read you're not um you're not taking clamps and opening up their eyes and forcing them to read you're giving them you're you're giving them a story they love, and I think that's awesome. You're not just you're adding something of value to their life, and I, I think that's a great thing. And I, I think that we should all strive to a lot make write make books make fiction uh, write in a way that people forget that they're even reading what we're writing because it's so good. Congratulations, you got to the end of my podcast. So you either had to listen to my voice. Or you had to listen to my voice and watch my face, which I don't envy you. Let's just say that. But if, you, uh, if you're if you someone who likes this podcast and you're thinking, you know, I'd like to support him in this podcast or the other creative things he's doing, creative things I'm doing, uh, you know, there's a few things you can do. Because some people, some people don't know what they can do to support people who create stuff. So these are the few things you can do that will really, really help me. First of all, check out my website. Check out the other things I'm doing. Uh, second comment on things, share them, like them, subscribe. Subscribe if you haven't already. And the third thing you can do is give reviews on different places, all right? So uh, the biggest thing for this podcast is going on to iTunes, giving it an honest review, telling people why you like it, telling people why you hate my voice, why you hate my face, but telling people why they should really check it out despite the fact that I have so many failings in terms of looks and voice. Um, other than that, if you if you want to check out my books, grab a grab a copy of the book, and uh, listen to the serialized novel. Give give digital copies away. That's a really big thing too. I always want to give you something 
that is valuable to you. I always want to give someone listening to this podcast something that's going to, going to stick with them or a book that they can actually own. Uh, and, and you can own that book for very, very cheap. So go check that out on Amazon. Uh, the different things I said, subscribe, upvote, comment, share, and definitely, definitely give it a review on, on iTunes. All right, as always, my name is Daniel Poppy, and this is How to Write Good.